So let's go, let's go back to the beginning because you have an amazing story. You start out, it's 1975, 1976, and you are literally fixing chicken coops. And you get a magical call one day from the manager of Journey, and they ask if uh, you want to be their lead singer. How did that come about? I mean, how do you go from fixing chicken? There was a guy at Columbia Records uh, named Charlie, and he ran the risk of being fired because his superior didn't really believe in me that much. But he did. And Charlie sent my demo tape of a band I was in at the time called The Alien Project, which later was also called Street Talk before the album came out. And um, he sent that to Herbie, the manager of Journey, and said, you know, you guys are really thinking about a singer. This is somebody you should consider before you, you know, close the door. And uh, Herbie liked it and played that demo tape for the band uh, while they were driving to Sacramento for a gig, I was told. And, you know, Herbie believed in me, I honestly believe, a lot more than the band did at the time. Because I think they wanted to be successful on their own terms, which was a fusion, rock, instrumental-oriented, you know, band. Right. And Herbie wanted it to be different and and grow, and he pushed them to consider me. So it was Herbie's belief in me, uh, the manager of Journey, that really convinced him, I think, finally, to give me a shot. And so he called me, and the next thing I know, I'm in De- I'm in uh, Denver, Colorado, mm. in Denver, Colorado, with Neil Sean in a hotel, uh, and they just finished opening for um, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and I go back to the hotel. I'm not playing with the band yet. I'm just hanging out. And I go back to the hotel room, and Neil and I wrote the song Patiently together, Um which, if you listen to the lyrics, is exactly what it was at the time that I was waiting for their lights to shine on me. For the song inside of me, This We Bring to You, it was about me wanting to be in the band and wanting to be in front of their audience and, and contribute to what that whole thing was. And so that's kind of how it all came together. Was there a time where in your life where prior to joining Journey, you thought, I am going to be fixing chicken coops for the rest of my life. Oh, you have no idea. I was, I'm was i a drummer, first and foremost, and uh, I became a drummer-singer my whole life. So I was, I was really a pretty damn good drummer, but I also could sing. And so I was really hired a lot and I was always working. And there was a country-western group in Fresno that should remain nameless, <laughs> and they would play... Six nights a week, and we'd do after hours to four in the morning on the weekend. Well, I was either stuck at the turkey ranch rebuilding these turkey brooders, these coops, or I was playing that country music. And I'm telling you, I became very fond of country music. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to work at that turkey ranch anymore. Right. And um, and 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 I actually became very fond of the songwriting aspect of country music and started to really get into it um, from a creative standpoint too. But I thought I was going to be stuck in those clubs or at the Turkey Ranch for the rest of my life. It was That's why I kept on shuttling uh, with my little Volkswagen I had at the time from Fresno to Los Angeles, which was the mecca at the time of the music business, to try to get somebody to listen. Was there, kept trying. Was, was there a point where you just kind of gave up? There was a point when I gave up. I had that band, uh, The Alien Project, which was the demo tape that was sent to Herbie. Um, the reason the tape was sent to Herbie was that my bass player uh, got killed in a car wreck the 4th of July weekend before we were supposed to talk to Columbia and Chrysalis Records to be signed. Back then, being signed to a record label was the sweetest thing that could happen to any musician or a band, you know. And the bass player who I'd written a lot of material with got killed in a car wreck the 4th of July weekend. So I called my mom that week and I said, Mom, you know, I just don't think I'm supposed to do this. Every time I get this close, this knocks me out. If I get that close, that knocks me out. Now, I've never been closer in my life, and Richard was killed in a car wreck. And it's like, oh, I just, I, just re- I just said to her, literally, I've given my notice. I'm coming back. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm not supposed to do this. I, I just, and so she said, I'll never forget. She says, no, no, no. I'm sorry about what happened, but just don't, just something will happen. Just relax. I said, Mom, I already gave notice. 
to my room, uh, my little tiny room I was living in. And uh, a week later, Herbie called me because he got that tape from Charlie. And said, I want you to be, go meet Neil Sean in Denver, Colorado. That's amazing. The rest is history. And, and it's amazing that, you know, most parents, at least today, uh, when their kids say, hey, Dad, I want to be in a band. It's like, uh, okay, go finish your geometry homework. Uh, your mom, obviously, was very supportive in your career. Yes, she was. My dad was a singer, and he never got to follow his dreams. And then he ended up divorcing when I was seven. So that was really a tough time uh, because he was. it was great to have a dad who sang and, you know, sang songs to you and things at night. Uh, but they divorced. and and so. She continued against her father's, her father's will was for me to become a farmer uh, because that's what he was. He wanted me to take over his farm, and I was not going to do that. I wanted to be a singer, uh, and that was it. And I was propelled, I think, emotionally as a kid. The fact that my dad was a singer and was gone, the fact that my dad never wanted to be a farmer. I didn't want to be a farmer. And on behalf of my dad, and against my grandfather at the time, which is what kids do, you, you muster up the fervor to go your own way. And I kept pushing, but she stood by me. She certainly did, in spite of what her father said, which was, you know, this kid, we should go back to school, you know. Oh, I know. I know. Cause I got but, he, to... but he was right, though. Cause yeah. He said to me, he says, look, my grandfather was an old Portuguese guy from, from the Azor Islands. He came here years, years ago. And he, he was right. He said that the future of America, the future of the world, is going to be electronics. You should get into electronics because I was into electronics as a kid. I'd make all these circuit boards and things as a kid. I loved making things work, hmm. the batteries and switches. And I, who knows, I could have been, I could have been Steve Jobs. You I could, don't know. You could have been, but... <laughs> <laughs> could but have been it, a contender. I could have been somebody. You know, you could have been somebody, but you just became one of the uh, one of the greatest uh, singers of uh, of all time. Now, let me ask you this: so you get the gig with Journey, and throughout uh, the late seventies through the eighties, you are living the high life. You are a very successful musician. You're you're getting all the accoutrements. I'm assuming of being one of the uh, one of the best uh, bands in America. And you're you're playing to sold out houses uh, across the country. You're making the money. You've got all this stuff, and then you voluntarily walk away. And I guess my question is: Was that it? Was that it? It seems like an easy decision, but I guess in my mind, it had to be one of the most difficult decisions you'd ever made in your life. Absolutely, the truth. 100% the truth. Uh, my whole life I had reached for the dream of what we had at that moment, and we got it. And it was working, and we were still selling out um, 20,000 theaters every night. Um, I was just toast. I was burnt. Uh, the ride was an amazing one. Uh, and I probably could have kept going. But with all the rock and roll stimulus, uh, adoration, bad behaviors, I might say, <laughs> along uh, yeah. the way occasionally. Uh, it was time to jump off the merry-go-round. It really was. And I I made a decision. I had lost my mother the year before, and then went back on the road and um, never processed any of it. And I'm back on the road every night, and uh, I don't know. I think it took its toll because I couldn't keep on shoving certain aspects of my life behind me and figuring I'll deal with them later, you know? Uh, and the rock and roll life really affords you the ability to do that because every night, if you work hard, sing well, people love you every night and you're getting what you've been reaching for your whole life. But got to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere of your life at some time, and you're going to get a few cones on the nose. You're going to be burnt on the way in. you got to do it. And I had to come down. I had to come down. I just knew in my heart i got to land. Um, uh, it's going to be hard on the re-entry. i just got to just let it all go and find out 
how much of my life life is still standing. And when I did that, uh, needless to say, the band was upset with me for doing it. Uh, there were a lot of fans who were upset with me. For it. But I had to do it. Because that I, I was crashing emotionally. Uh, and the only way, to be honest with you, was to just uh, jump off, hit, hit the ground running, and, uh, and get some road burn on, on my feet, you know, really, until I stopped. So I went back to my hometown. I had a Harley Davidson that I had parked in a secret spot there. And I literally would jump on that bike. This is before helmets in California. I'd jump on that bike and I would ride around the country, single country road of the San Joaquin Valley for miles with the wind in my hair and trying to figure out who am I, what am I, what do I want, what don't I want, you know, what's left standing Steve Perry's life. Steve Perry before he became Steve Perry. Right. And it was really important to do because it sustained me now to where I'm talking to you about it, and I'm okay talking about anything you want to talk about. I mean, anything you want to talk about, I'm there. I'm with you because I'm. I now know how I feel about everything. I don't think I did. I know it's a little complex, but it's. I know we're doing little, little one-on-one therapy on your show here. But the truth is, you know, this, there's too much. There's too much complete adoration that can happen, and people die from. Uh, that much encouragement, you know. Look around. You've seen it happen. Oh, yeah. And so I jumped. I jumped. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm sad that I did, but I'm glad I did. Do I miss it? Oh, God, I miss it. Oh, my God, I, I, miss, I miss it terribly. Uh, performing in front of everybody was everything I ever wanted. Uh, but I had to jump off ship. You know, you know what's interesting is you're a guy who could go and do anything, go anywhere, but you chose to go back to, is it Hanford? Yes. You, you, your, your hometown of Hanford, which is... I went uh, back to Hanford, California, my hometown, and yeah. I, I would spend time in front of my old house I was raised in. Uh, I, I would... I would go to the cemetery where my mom was and my grandfather was, grandmother was. And uh, I'm an only child, and, I, and I, I started to just get reflective about the time we had together, how it really did happen. Because I'm telling you, uh, I'm not complaining. Please don't. I want to make something very clear that everybody who's listening and you should know. I am not complaining. I would do it all in a second if I could. Again, exactly the way it was. Okay? Mm-hmm. And I would probably jump off ship at the same place again, too. Yeah, I'm telling you. But I just needed to regroup and what was important. And, uh, and the time we really did have together that raised the people who raised me. You know, some old friends that I hadn't seen in a long time. Right. And a lot of them I couldn't be friends with anymore because they treated me so differently. And it, was, it was a bit of a wake-up call. Is it, is it true, Steve, that when you become a, a, a success... Is it true that you stay the same, but everybody else seems to change? No, I don't think anybody who becomes successful, as that word implies, does not get infected by their success. I'm sorry. I was a prick sometimes. <laughs> okay. I was just, I was just, a, uh, I was a cocky, infected emotionally guy, you know? Yeah. Because uh, because you reach your whole life to be somebody, finally you are, you know, you get a little cocky. Right. So it can be infectious in a not a good way. So surviving that, by the way, is also so important. It's a, just forget about that shit. Forget about it. Sorry, I'm using that, superlatives on your show. That's okay. We have sure a delay. I'm going to have to cut up. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you know, I just... Uh, I think it, it, it. I'm grateful for all of it. I really, I'm grateful for all of it. I'm. Uh, I'm okay where I'm at, and I, I. I embrace it all right now, and and I think that people do get infected by their success, and other people, your friends, get infected by your success. Sometimes things make it. Sometimes they don't. So let me ask you. You you. I don't where I don't know where the last show was before you 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 know walked away from the stage, but you know basically you leave the tour the solo tour. You, okay, so was it... Well, the last journey was in Alaska. 
Okay. My knowledge. Yeah. And then you did the, the real show. Yeah. <laughs> and then you did the solo tour and then you, and then it was done. What, what was it like when you, when you just made that decision to, all right, I'm done. Did you feel the weight, a weight lift off your shoulders? Just like, it's like when, you know, if, for the, for the people listening, it's like if you quit a job and you feel that weight off your shoulders, was that the way it was for you when you got on that plane and headed back to California? No, not at all. I was terrified. No because kidding. I had, I had made a commitment to let go of, uh, of a mothership, so to speak, that had, that had floated, sustained me, lifted me, uh, given me so much, uh, working with that band and being successful with, with the band and writing music with the band and performing with all the millions of people with that band. It, it just sustained me and given me so much uh, that uh, I was really scared to live without it. That's what told me I got to go. Interesting. And if I'm going to survive, I need to let it go because it's just, I've seen too many people become completely dependent on that. And if they don't have it, then they get into very deep emotional problems. You know what I mean? I, I'm I, okay. yeah. and, and, and by the time I did my solo tour, uh, I had worked through all that tour. I actually enjoyed all aspects of my life. Walking around New York City during the day, playing at the Beacon Theater at night. No big deal. Okay, so we are now in 2012. This this is going to air after New Year's. So we're okay. now in 2012. Uh, you have obviously completely moved on. You haven't really done much in the in in the way of of. As far as I know, performing, I haven't seen. I see videos of you at Giants games on YouTube. Um, right. What what's what's a day in the life of Steve Perry like these days? I was working for a couple of years down here in San Diego on a remodel of a house. I got that done, and I've been working hard on dialing in this little recording studio that I'm building. So that's been a real consuming thing. So you're so you're put so so that is actually good news for Journey fans and for not Journey fans but Steve Perry fans is that no you're... it's it's all good I mean I certainly wrote a lot of material and I'm, I'm my intention is to get in the studio and I've said before I said the only problem I have about making music and recording music again is me yeah <laughs> no. no I get it I'm the only problem because I'm the most difficult on myself nobody will do to me what I do to myself I mean I people have, can say whatever they want about me or to me. But it won't be nothing compared to what uh, difficulty I will have navigating around my own opinion. Right. Um, so, so that's the only thing that stands in the way of me getting music done and out. Is right. I'm going to do my best to stay out of my own way. Sure. Um, has Dan? Do you feel like you're you're? Have you said everything you want to say as far as being a songwriter? Do you feel like you want to move into another direction from what you typically have done? Are you thinking about maybe uh, writing for? Um, other artists, uh, you know, as you dip your toe back into it, what are you looking at doing? Well, at first, I just want to make uh, a whole bunch of tracks. I want to record a whole bunch of tracks, get them done, and let them stand on their own because they're all kind of unique and they're all kind of different. Uh, I have a lot of songs that were have sort of a cluster, similar sort of like footprint to them, and then other ones go left and like. Oh, this Who's that? You know, that doesn't even sound like him. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, I know. Uh, so I have some of those, too, because I just allowed myself the freedom when I was sketching music in my computer to, um, to completely go left if I wanted to and not stop myself. And so that's been a real thrill because it's allowed me to step out of anything that people might expect from me. You know? sure, I, yeah, I you have wouldn't... to give myself that. Right. It's, it's sort of like... You know, it's sort of like doing a solo record a little bit in the sense that you're going off and you're doing your own thing. You've people know you and your voice is instantly recognizable. You kind of maybe, OK, it's been a long time. You maybe want to try something just a little different with no pressure. I think so. And, 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 and the other thing is that the voice that was so, um, so unique to Journey was because I was the singer in that band. Um, I think that I brought a lot of melodic guitar solos and ideas out of Neil Sean that he can't do without me because I haven't heard him do them since. 
And by the way, there's a lot of things that Neil Sean brought out of me that I can't find without him, too, because there's a certain thing that happens with musicians that can't be defined, but you certainly influence each other in the moment to go to higher places. And um, that's what used to happen in that band a lot. So they would bring a side out of me that was unique to that situation. That, you know, I can, I can be close to it, but it would never really be the same. So that gives me a little bit of a, of a coupon of forgiveness for not sounding like the singer in Journey because I'm not injured. Yeah, yeah, and I understand that. And is that is that? I know you miss touring, or you or you miss performing. Yeah. Do do you miss the the writing and recording experience that you specifically had uh, with, with Jonathan uh, Kane and, and Neil Sean? Uh, do do you miss that aspect of it? I know you guys obviously have your differences, but there's that creative thing that that you guys accomplished that is so unique and amazing, it, right. it's got to be embedded in your head somehow. And you, you have yeah. your differences, but you have to miss that, at the very least, that, that creative process. Well, let me ask you a question. Are you married? I am. Okay. Uh, have you been married how long? 18 years feels like 105. <laughs> Hopefully she's not listening to that right now. <laughs> <laughs> so 18 years you've been married. Yeah. And... Before you were married, did you have a girlfriend? I had many, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you think of the one just before you got married? I can. I was with her for five years. Okay, so that was a five-year relationship. Um, sometimes when I think of Journey, I think of like a relationship that there were so many great things about it that I would love to have gone back to it. But they kind of run their course. And uh, for whatever reason, they stop. It doesn't mean that I don't have that emotional wish or contact or memory of how great it was and how I would love to do it again. It just can't go back sometimes. And uh, I've tried. I've tried even with relationships to do that. I have. And I. They, it doesn't work. It's somewhere else. And it's, unless you pretend you're not, it's tough. Yeah, and so it isn't. That, it isn't. I don't miss writing, singing with those guys. I just think it uh, has moved on. It's got to be tough for you in, in the sense that you guys created such magic. The good news is, you guys created incredible magic, and it, and and your the new album, if you will, greatest hits too, uh, is indicative of just the amazing catalog that you guys have. And um, and not even, I mean, all the great songs are on there, but one of the things I liked about Journey was you had a lot of songs that were not hits per se, but they were still great songs. How did you end up back involved with with Journey, if you will, remastering the, the catalog stuff? How, how did that all come about? Well, Sony really trusts my judgment, and, and it's really great that they do. I, I feel... Uh, I don't know, I, I feel grateful that they do. They keep calling me, and, and they called me to remaster The Greatest Hits 1 to vinyl on Virgin Vinyl, because that's what they wanted to re-release. And they said we should probably put together a Greatest Hits 2, because there's a whole bunch of songs like Stone of Love, or After the Fall, or Party's Over, or, or you know, Still They Ride. Stay I mean, there's a lot of songs right. uh, that, you know, are great songs feeling that way anytime from that era, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just, they were, they were what were called back in the day, AOR hits. And for people who don't know what AOR radio was, you could be an AOR hit artist and not have a top 40 artist and sell out arenas. And it's kind of going on again, but it's going on in a different way through the internet and all that now. But, but the point is that there was no semblance of those songs anywhere. So, Greatest Hits 2 was discussed by Sony, and they wanted me to go ahead and push it, for, put it together, and master it, and oversee the vinyl cutting of it. And so I did. It took about three months to do it. And when you when when you came back, if you will, into the journey fold, kind of far away, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. What was what was the reaction of the of like Neil and Jonathan, the other band members? Were they like? 
you know, why or I, I, I'm just. It's, well, it's no, I think I think that they, um, I think they gave the idea their blessing um, by not saying great, but by not stopping it. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I mean, they, they, they have as much rights in these areas as I do, and uh, and I think they kind of gave it a blessing by allowing it to happen. Uh, um, in both greatest hits and greatest hits too. I put together the original uh, running order of the songs I thought were important. Uh, John uh, saw them. Neil saw them. Uh, Neil had one change he wanted to make. Uh, we made that change. We substituted one song for another one. We pulled the one that we needed to pull because there's only so much real estate on vinyl. Right. Um, and so there it is. And and I think that through channels. Uh, Sony Music. Uh, we we collaborated on it. So you guys aren't and when sending it was all over. I I cut the lacquers, and uh, I would listen to them, make sure that they're not having problems. Go back and fix the problems, and then I would turn around once I got the test pressings and I liked them. I hand walked them over to their manager, and um, gave uh, three copies to them uh, for them to listen to and approve on both albums. I mean, so I mean that's just. I, I mean, these are these are the paintings on the wall of our time together. Yeah. In a in a in a musical sort of museum of its own, you know. And I think they have to be treated with reverence, and they have to be treated with with the respect that they deserve. And and that's been my feeling about them from day one. And I believe that's where they're at now. I think they really, I think they really know that it's important to uh, keep them restored and. In a good in a good condition. When you when you look back on all of the songs that you wrote, do you remember where you were and what you were doing? Do you remember writing those songs? I mean, or is I it do. just I do? You pick one, just pick one out of the top of the head, and I'll tell you where I was and what we did. Uh, okay, uh, just the same Name way. That too. J- just the same way. Okay, just the same way. Good call. That's mm-hmm. a tough one. You have no idea the wonkiness of my of my journey fandom. I'm I'm, I'm sparing the audience. The house, and uh, we were writing uh, that idea together, and then we took it to rehearsal, which I believe at that time was at SIR in San Francisco, because that's what we, we used to rehearse. Um, I believe that's where we came together. That song came together, and then really back in those days, those songs would uh, come together in the studio. In other words, you knew what you were doing. You knew the basic arrangement. You would cut the track, the basic track, and then start to build it as you go. So you, so you would compile the whole thing in the studio. It's not like yeah. See, those were the days. Where, those were the days when budgets uh, would allow that, and that's how everybody made records in, in the day. Was you would you would have those moments of, of being able to have access to a studio twenty four hours if you wanted, and doing whatever you want to do, and try all these ideas. And you had consoles running and uh, running and tape running. So that's where you wanted to be. If something great happened, you wanted to have some tape running. So those were things that would happen uh, while tape was running, magical moments, uh, basic tracks that were tracked, uh, overdubs that were happening, and stacked up vocals, mm-hmm. like the bridge of that song. Uh, you know where the vocals go, oh, no. Remember that part? It's yeah. like, that's, that's that. That's that's got to be forty Steve Perry's with Greg Rowley. <laughs> okay, yeah, they're just stacked. Yeah, they're overdubbed and stacked over and over again, and then blasted down to probably a pair of stereo tracks. Right, right. You know what's interesting about about Journey is you listen to my own personal favorite album. I will tell you is Evolution, um, and and I obviously wow, that's interesting. Tell me why. You know what? It, it's the songs. Um, I huh. I think I like the like, if you will, the, the rollicking piano of just the same way. I love. Do you recall the simplicity of it, if you will? Um, the 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 storytelling within loving you is easy. I mean, I could go on and on. Um, I love that song. That's so funny. That song never really saw the light of day, but it's one of my favorite songs. The interesting thing is. Is that if you listen to Infinity, Evolution, Departure, and then you come back to Escape, 
Right. And it was such a different sound. And was you it turned the corner? Yes, ex- exactly. It you turned the corner, and it was like, was right. that because Greg Rowley left the band and Jonathan came yeah. came in, or exactly right? You're you're, you're right on it. Uh, what happened was. Uh, the writing team had consisted of basically Neil, Sean, and myself were lights and a lot of songs, and and Greg Rowley would have a few ideas, and we would do like feeling that way, and any t- you know stuff like that. Um, then Neil and I would write any way you want it, and, and we'd come up with ideas like "Good Morning Girl," which was done like in a minute. You know that song was recorded, and I'll be saying it in a minute in one pass, and it was done. And then Neil's father, Matt Sean, did a string arrangement that was done in a minute. We just put it away, said, "Okay, that's done." We didn't- we may not even use that song. And then you go back and listen to it, and you go, what? wow, that's got this emotion to it. Yeah. So uh, that was one landscape of emotional writing. And then we were in Europe, in Germany to be exact, and Greg Rowley turned to us one night after a gig, said that he really thinks he's kind of ready to get out of touring. He had been touring for years with Santana, he'd been touring with Journey for years, and he wanted to raise a family, and he told us he wanted to get out. And so when we got back to the States, we were just trying to figure out what we're going to do next. And uh, we played some shows in America, and there was John Waite in The Babies. And Jonathan Cain was playing piano in The Babies at the time. And so Greg Rowley turned to us and said, you know, if there's anybody I think you guys should look at to replace me, it would be this guy. I mean, we pointed at him while he's performing one night. So we started watching him, and we thought, maybe so. So when The Babies were done touring, Jonathan King came, came over and entered the, the, the fray, you know. And um, one of the first songs we wrote together, if not the first song, was I had this idea of Who's Crying Now, and I had sketched it in a set on the way back to San Francisco from my hometown area on the, on the lonely freeway of the I-5. And I had this hook line, you know, one love sees the fire, one heart better than wonder who's crying now this whole thing, you know, and, and, and I had the rhythm in my mind because I'm a drummer. So when I saw John, we got together and knocked that song out in a day. In a day. No kidding. We wrote it. It was done. We just needed to teach it to the band. You know? <laughs> so um, that's how that came together, you know. Uh, so we did turn a corner. Uh, the next song that John showed up at my house with, was he brought his old Wurlitzer piano over my house, and we were going to write a song. I didn't know what that day. We were just going to write. So he shows up, puts this, put this piano in the office, and he starts playing these melodies and things, and all of a sudden he plays this melody with his right hand. And I'm going, John, what's that? He says, oh, it was just a little thing that I played once for John Waite when I was the babies, and he never liked it. I said, well, why didn't he like it? He said he thought it was a bit too syrupy. I said, too syrupy? I said, that's just a gorgeous melody to me. Mm-hmm. That's a beautiful melody. He said, really? Are you sure? I said, John, you know, too bad for John Wake. Good for us, because we're going to write that. That's beautiful. So he played it. I sang that melody in the verse. Then I came up, we sailed on together. We drifted apart, did the whole thing, you know. And we wrote the chorus that day. We literally did the lyrics the next day. So the answer is yes. When John Cain showed up, we turned a corner. And we didn't leave Neil behind. We brought Neil into it. Everything Neil and I had done together with John now was done the three of us. And that's where songs like Don't Stop Believing came from. Now, the, the three of you, uh, all three of you writing the song, what was the dynamic like? It, what, did it work better? When the three of you wrote, or when it was just you and Neil, or the three of you? It really was catch-all. I mean, anything anything could happen. Um, sometimes three was more confusing than two, so, and it worked against us. Uh, usually, when it was a three-way split, it would be three-way on the music, usually, meaning we'd talk about changes and inversions and rhythms and, and chord, uh, I mean, arrangements of the song. I'd have the melodies, I'd have the hook lines, I'd have everything written melodically, and I would go to John's house, just the two of us, and we'd spend about a week writing the lyrics. Interesting. Uh, that, that, that that is, yeah. you know, it, it's it's interesting in the sense that um, you you listen to the music your entire life, and 
seemingly never getting tired of hearing the same song 70,000 times as most, uh, you know, Journey and Steve Perry fans do. And, but it's interesting to hear the stories in, in the dynamic behind it. And have you ever, um, outside of Journey, have you ever felt like you're, you're better writing again outside of, outside of Journey? Are you, do you feel like you're better writing by yourself or do you prefer to write with, uh, with someone else? It's so different. They all have their pluses. They really do. Uh, there's times I'm running by myself and I can just go wherever I want. And there's times I wish I had somebody to throw a couple of chords in because I, I have a, I have a Peter principle in, in certain areas of knowledge. Uh, then there's times when I'm with people and their input is actually too much and I want to keep it simple. So, but then there's times it just clicks. I wrote, Three or four songs, or maybe five, with this writer from uh, who should remain nameless at this point. Uh, I met this guy in a studio, and he was he was doing he was producing some music, and we just started talking. Right? And I just kind of vibe. I said, you know, we should we should write sometime. Yeah, well, we should. We got together. We knocked out, I think, in one, at least five tunes with lyrics. In a matter of a week. Wow. They're all sketched in my computer, and now I just got to go back. And the problem with me is that some of the vocals I don't think I'll ever do better again, so I'm going to thank God for Pro Tools. <laughs> I can just start. Um, I can keep some of them, and I can uh, put real drums on them, because most of the time it's sketched with the machine, so we right. just you know, get going. Right. Now, is there a temptation to play oh. the drums yourself? You know, I... <laughs> I am setting up a drum kit in the tracking room of my studio. And my purpose for that is to get back on the drums a little bit because I have certain ideas and rhythms that I'm tired of trying to tell people about. Right. I just want to just do them. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. <laughs> and see if they suck or not. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you're a musician, obviously, by trade. Music is in your heart. It it has to be tough for you, I would think. And I'm not a musician, obviously. But it has to be difficult for you, knowing that you have all this ability and all this music in your in your heart and your soul, not to just get behind the drums and just bang around for a while. Well, you know, I purposely shut it down. You know, I walked away from the whole mothership journey when you we were on top. I. I really jumped off of it when it was still going because um, I needed to. I needed to get off and go back to my hometown, you know, and uh, just be Steve Perry from Hanford, California, and ride my motorcycle and try to put pieces back together because um, music business can be a place that you can die from encouragement. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, and I didn't want to be a statistic. And I just wanted to fall back into my life. So um, I, you, you know, you, I opened up a plethora of thoughts by going into this area. What was your original statement to me a second ago? Uh, my, my, original, my original statement was just how you have music in your heart and your, and your soul and, to, right. and you're a musician at, by, by trade. And, and it just had, right. had to be difficult for you just from a creativity yeah. standpoint. It was very, okay, yeah, thank you. It was Because when I open up the idea of jumping off out of journey, it opens up a painful moment that I had to leave the very thing I loved so much. And I had to literally like walk up to the spigot and turn the water off and turn it off tight. Right. And not let it leak because I need to walk away from it. Right. Uh, it's just something I needed to do for my own head, for my life fall back into what life I was really born into, which was I was Ray and Mary's son, and I just wanted to go back to that. I really did. And I wanted to be my father's son. I wanted to be my mother's son. Uh, I'm an only child. They were both gone. I needed to reclaim a lot of that. And that meant going back to my hometown and spending time at the cemetery and driving my Harley in the country roads. Yeah burning out the cobwebs and, and, and doing some serious soul searching as to what's important and what's not important. But do you think for one second that my heart hasn't bled from the moment I left that stage? It's been terrible. It, 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 There's times I just get angry at myself. Yeah. 
that I had to. Well, you sound so conflicted. It was, it, it, I am still conflicted. Oh, no, there's no doubt. I am so conflicted. But, but I will tell you the upside of all this. Two and a half years ago, or three years ago, was the first time I bought my laptop and I loaded it with Pro Tools. And I allowed myself the opportunity to open up the faucet again and let, let it drip a little bit, see what I could find. Right. And at first, it kind of sucked. I didn't like what I was getting, and I shut it off and said, yeah, well, <laughs> you don't want to do that, so you just might as well just shut that down. Right. And then I gave myself a little bit of a coupon of, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know, just a coupon, you know? You gave yourself gave a yourself break. A break. A frickin' coupon. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. A break, you yeah, know? Right. And and looking at the arc of success and how much we've all been through together and apart and, and how much it did so much for our lives and how it did so much to our lives, I'm not complaining. Please, I don't want you to think that. But I'm just talking reality. Here. And I wanted, to, I wanted to survive it and come back emotionally loving it, not just with the spigot turned off. You know right. what I'm saying? I, I, I totally get so, what you're saying. So I gave myself the coupon to, to open the waters a little bit and start to enjoy it again. Yeah. And that led to the studio being built. So that's all I can tell you is it's taken a while for me to really find my heart again for mm -hmm. music. I love music. again. You know, when I got off that journey tour, I could not listen to music for a whole year. You're I was kidding. so emotionally burnt for music. I don't know. It was something... Damage. Yeah, that that's amazing. I mean, it, it, music was your whole life for so many years, and then you just shut off your involvement in well, the music you industry. Know, we toured like we toured like nobody tours ever. Right. You know. Yeah. We toured. We would have six shows in a row, and with traveling, because we weren't big enough to do six one nighters right. in one town. Right. We would do small venues or bigger venues, but there was like eight hour runs or 10 hour, 12 hour runs between nights. Right. Right. Run stop. I'll never forget the first tour. We left February 1st. I got back December 20th. Oh my. And all I remember was somewhere along the line, this band called Van Halen started opening for us <laughs> and they started kicking our ass every night. Yeah. Made us play better. And the next thing I know, I'm home around December 20th. Finally, I'm, I, I didn't have an apartment. I just parked my Volkswagen at my mom's driveway. I said, well, I'm, I'm gone. I'm rolling. I, I've hotel, I live in a hotel. Right. So I get back the 20th of December. I never forget the phone rang one morning. <laughs> this is the God's truth. And I remember being almost what we used to call road burn. From traveling, you get a kick, your mind gets in a in a, a very weird fantasy road burn kind of state. Mm -hmm. where you don't know where you are. You don't know really what's going on. You just know what you're doing. Right. And I jumped out of bed, ran down the hallway into the kitchen, buck naked, oh. thinking I was late for the bus. <laughs> this is the God's strike me dead truth. Oh My no. My mother's in there drinking her coffee, smoking her cigarette, looked at me and said. What are you doing? And I went, uh, <laughs> nothing. And I went back to bed. <laughs> okay. And then the next day, I felt a little better. And I went to the telephone and dialed nine for a line out. Oh, my. This is the God's truth. I'm not making yeah. this up. So that's road burn. That's what road burn does to you. You're, you're in a role. Yeah. And, and you're doing what you do. And, and you, you're in a real loop. As you talk about road burn and you talk about the the grueling tour and why you had to get get jump off the journey train, do you think that the journey fans, the Uber journey fans, understand? I do, by the way. I get it. Do you think the 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 fans, the Steve Perry fans, do you think they understand that, or do you think they just don't get it and and never will? Well. I just don't want him to think for a nanosecond that I'm whining. Right. Because I'm not. I'm just only reporting the emotional landscape and 
instability <laughs> that comes right. with not knowing where you are from night to night, but absolutely addicted like a drug to the audience, their faces, their adoration, their their joys, their laughter, their their applause. You are so addicted to being whatever they want you to be. And I got to tell you, it dawned on me when I was doing an interview one time with Joe Benson at KLOS recently. I told Joe, I said, let me tell you something, Joe, that, that, that getting away from it and coming back to it has given me this perspective. That voice that I had out there never was mine. He said, what are you talking about? I said, that voice never belonged to me. I don't understand. I said, what I mean by that is, I certainly can conjure up who I am, and I can sing like that. But that extra little push, or large push, that pushed emotionally my voice over that edge, that I would be taken somewhere I could not get without that audience looking at me, wanting me to go there. Without them wanting me to go there, I can't get there. So therefore, the voice belongs to them, not mine. Because I can't get it without them. And that's how important they were to me. If you think I wanted to take myself out of that? Absolutely not. They took me places. I couldn't go without them. And when I was there, we all went there together. Right. And it was like, that's something that you can't find in the living room of your house. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, just, you know? Yeah, I know. You just can't. Yeah. And so... So if there's ever anything that I want the audiences to understand that I was absolutely indebted to and a slave to their inspiration of what they could bring out of me that I couldn't find without them, uh, but I had to walk away at the same time because otherwise I, I probably would have been still going. And, well, when you, when, you, when you look at musicians and you, and you look at... Um, you know the the ones that have have died from drug overdose, alcohol asphyxiation. Not that that's where you were going, uh, but it 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 makes the reasoning why you walked away more understandable. Because well, you 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 nailed it. I mean, I think from an intoxicating standpoint, what I just described does not not sound intoxicating. It it does. Does it not sound? emotionally absolutely infectious to where you you don't want to leave it and i didn't but the problem was at the time to be perfectly honest we had a manager who didn't know how to say no and i kept telling him to back off on some of the rooting because it was getting a little heavy and he wouldn't i finally said i want to stop because you're not you're not you're not backing it off right you know the, the, the pacing I'm talking about. Yep, you know? yep. It's like a baseball manager who leaves the starting pitcher in too long. To you like baseball, so I'm I'm going back to the baseball yeah. analogy. It's like it's like a, a pitcher who's done after seven, but he leaves him in for eight. That's right, and he thinks he's going to be able to pull himself out of it. Right. You know, he's lost his strike zone. Right. He knows he has, but he thinks maybe he's going to be able to pull himself out of it and get it back. Right. And and he's hurting him at the same time. But there's a, there's also a very similar analogy that people don't care because at that point they have other things in mind. They just want to win the da damn game. And they get lost in pushing you. And I got tired of the push. And I felt a little like, hey, man, you know, I'm, I'm falling apart out here. I'm kind of crashing. And uh, so I jumped off. Interesting. So how did you, with all that touring, how did your voice... Stay so incredibly pristine. I mean, I know you're a, you're a trained singer, but I mean, just just from from so much use, you would think that that your voice would have given out. But I mean, the last time I heard something you recorded, uh, it's been years, obviously. But I mean, you still have that sound. You 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 can still hit the the you know the the registers, if you will. How did you take care of your voice with with all this constant touring? It was the hardest thing. I I just. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I was getting so burned out that I started, you know, you know, we drank a little bit. The band had some drinking, you know, mm -hmm. we, we were a rock and roll band. Mm -hmm. uh, and that certainly doesn't help a voice if you're late night drinking. Uh, so when you combine the usage and the, the repetitive amount of shows and 
staying up too late, eventually it started to take a toll on the voice too. Yeah. And uh, I didn't like that either. You know, I was having some difficulty with my voice, things that I never had before. Oh, really? Oh, sure. Interesting. Oh, sure. Oh, I started to hear, you know, I used to be able to do things in my sleep. Well, it wasn't easy as, as that anymore. I had to really go get it. Right. And once you have to start go getting it, now you're manufacturing and pushing kind of harder. Right. The harder you push, the more you might be getting yourself in trouble. So, you know, you put all that together, and we're talking about lots of miles on the body. And right. I mean, I've, I've had a hip replacement. I've had other orthopedic repairs mm-hmm. since then, which I won't get into, mm-hmm. because due to due to touring in my... Um, I'm like a football player, really, who, who, who played the game, and uh, when you get older... My God, you remember now some of the hits you took. Right, right. And, and, and it, yeah. But once again, I'm not whining. I don't. No, I'm just you're not you. whining. I'm giving you the inside truth. And and it, did you as you as you as you felt your voice was giving you a hard time? Did you find yourself having to adjust the set list? No, uh, I still went after it. And, okay. And we didn't change keys either. I mean, I would have loved to change some keys, but we didn't. Uh, Neil likes the open open tuning and uh and so when you get into that and, and he has good reason for that i mean uh, things just sound better right do you have any regrets oh you are rough this is a good interview that's why it's gone so long you really uh, are good now let me ask you do you talk about in general in life or you talk about specific to my music or band issue you know what um Personally, what would be your preference? I would, I would, you personally? know what? If I, I don't want to butt into your business, but I would love to know personally if you have any regrets. It's a tough one. It's a tough one because I don't regret where my life went, and I would do it exactly the same as I did it to this minute right now. Talking to you, I'd repeat it all again every single night, every single performance, and I would even repeat jumping off the ship because it got heavy. I would do it all again if I could. Mm-hmm. But that being said, I don't know if it's a regret because I couldn't do what I'm about to say. My DNA was not tuned to what I'm about to say. My DNA was tuned to doing what I did. My DNA was tuned to reaching to be a singer, to wanting to be the best I could possibly be. My dad was a singer. I wanted to be a singer. I wanted to stand on stage. I was three years old. I told my mother, I want to be a movie tar. She said, a movie tar? What's a movie tar? I said, I just want to be a movie tar. Three years old, you don't know how to say movie star. I, I said, movie tar. So she knew at a very young age, I just had this calling, and I used to sing around the house at three, four years old. So she nurtured that. So I was reaching for it from a very young age. Now, that all being said, I probably couldn't have changed my course. But if I had to look back, I wish I had the ability, which I did. I kind of wish I had the ability to have a normal life, which would have meant baseball, wife, two, three kids, minivan, uh, movies on Friday, and Chinese food on Sunday. Wow. I mean, I I really think that uh, it's not a regret. I have to make it clear, but I just am so enamored with people who have that. I am so respective, and I wish they were. I, I mean, they're the ones who watch me wishing I they had my life. Uh, you're they're absolutely the ones right. Who go, God, that must be great. You know? uh-huh. And yes, it is. But I look at them going, you're all so lucky, my friend, because your calling said that your life is rich and enough. And my calling said it's not. So there was a price to pay. Yeah. But I loved what we did. I would do it again. But if there was but if there was that I think one people thing, are, their lives are enriched when they can be satisfied and happy with two, three kids, a wife, and a minivan, and baseball and Chinese. You you have literally just described my life and probably the life of uh, the majority of the listeners. Uh, so that. Is is actually because quite it's amazing. A rich, very full, wonderful life. 
yeah. that I, I, I just, I'm enamored with. I'm enamored with. And by the way, I, I write songs about. Yeah. I write songs about your life. Is there anything you would like to tell your fans who are going to probably hear this uh, on the radio, but also on podcasts and so on and so forth? Anything you want to say? Well, gosh, that, you know, we've said so much so far. I feel like I'm hogging, hogging the airways here with you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, you know, um, I don't know. I just, I just truly, uh, am, I'll be forever grateful for how everybody has changed my life. You know, they, they believed in me when, uh, when I just needed to be believed in so badly. I wanted to be good for them so that they would believe in me, and I, I wanted to be whatever it took to make that happen, for them to pull for me and not let them down after they did believe in me. You know what I mean? I, yep. it, it, this is the kind of relationship that, it, to me, that was going on from the stage. Maybe they don't know about, but that's what was behind it all. Uh, I think that's called performing. I think that's called wanting your approval. And tell me I'm good and I'll be better for you. You know, I mean, it's just all those things. I was just trying my best to uh, to be those things. And, and and the interplay that happened between us as a result of their approval and me reaching and me reaching in their approval. We, you know, like I said earlier, they took me to new places that I could never be without them vocally, emotionally, and songwriting. I just think they need to know that. They need to know that none of it happened. None of it happens without them. They make it all happen. They make all the emotions possible. They make the songwriting possible. It really starts with them. And so that's basically what I can take it. Steve Perry, thank you very much. This has been amazing.